MMA has changed so much since when you got into it, and I'm sure it's going to keep evolving and changing over the next 10, 15, 20 years. What do you think about where it's at right now? I mean, the big money fights right now in boxing, at least, are with Logan Paul and Jake Paul. What do you think of yeah. what's going on? Yeah, these crossover fights, you know, obviously the first guy that only got to come the other way was James Tony in 2008 mm -hmm. in Boston. And uh, it was a huge fight, a fight that I took very seriously. I felt like, you know, the reputation of our sport was on the line in some ways for that, for that fight. Uh, I had a lot of respect for James as a boxer. The real question was how much MMA was he really going to be able to learn? And I think we answered that question pretty quickly. Uh, <laughs> but now we got these, uh, you know, just saw Anderson Silva and Tito, you yeah, know, Vitor Vitor Balfour. Balfour against the Vander Holyfield. I mean, holy cow. Yeah. Uh, these trillers, you know, that's Anderson's second great fight in boxing. Um, we've always known Belfort was a, a solid striker. I mean, that's one of the things you had to really focus on when you were facing him in MMA. He showed those skills again on Saturday against Evander. You know, I'm not a fan of all the antics and, and the rhetoric and all that from the Paul brothers, but if they are doing something, it's poking Dana White and shining a light on the disparaging difference between fighting fighters pay in MMA versus fighters pay in boxing. There's no transparency in MMA. How are you supposed to negotiate your fair value in the marketplace if nobody knows how much money is being made in the sport in each and every event? Those are That transparency is in boxing because of the Ali Act that was implemented in 1996 to protect boxers from, from promoters like Aram and, and Don King that we're taking advantage of, of a lot of the boxing world. Um, we don't enjoy those luxuries and those protections from that federal legislation in MMA. Yeah. Now, I think that the Fertitas knew exactly what they were looking at in 2001 when they bought the company. In 96, when the Ali Act was implemented, Lorenzo Fertitta was the Nevada State Athletic Commission commissioner. He was in charge of the whole show back then. So he knew exactly what was going on. And, uh, you know, when they sold the company in 2016 for $4.2 billion, they got a lot of people's attention, especially a lot of fighters going, what? Holy cow. Yeah. So we need that transparency. We need that same protection from that same federal legislation uh, in the sport of mixed martial arts and all the combat the combative sports. Why not? It's an easy yeah. thing to change the definition of, of that legislation to combative sports athlete instead of just boxing. Yeah. You adjust some of the language because the rounds in MMA and some of the other sports that are doing pay-per-view in, com in combative sports are different as well. But other than that, it's a, it's a simple fix. Um, so, I, you know, we're lobbying hard to try and get that to a vote in, in Congress and then in, on the Senate floor. Obviously, with the relationship between Trump and Dana White, it was going to be very difficult to get that done during that administration. But we're not having much success now either because the UFC has still got lobbyists working against us, got us thrown out of energy and commerce, which is where the Ali Act was originally implemented. Um, you know, they're doing their, their due diligence to keep this from getting to, to a vote because if anybody really looks at the situation, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, We had 60 Congress people on both sides of the aisle ready to vote on this um, because it is, it is so stark and obvious that we need some transparency and protections for mixed yeah. martial artists as well. With you talking about all of this, does this mean that you now have some sort of a relationship with UFC? I have no relationship with, with the UFC and that's largely because of Dana White. You know, right. he, he decided that I was the enemy uh, oh, quite a while ago, actually when they bought the company, we butted heads almost immediately over ancillary rights and contracts Nobody else was paying attention at that time when, when, you know, they were, I'm not sure who was holding whose feet to the fire back then, but we weren't, we weren't getting along very well. Um, I think they felt like they were stuck with me when they bought the company. I was the heavyweight champion. I just signed with new management. We started pointing out a lot of the issues in this 17 page piece of crap document that they call the contract. And, and uh, you know, I'm one of the few fighters that owns his own ancillary rights and we kind of forced them to adjust some things. Now, some of that was okay for me, but it, it, it the backlash to that was they tightened up their contracts. They made their contracts even worse than they were before. 
because I was poking them about ancillary rights and some of this other stuff. So that kind of sucks for all the other fighters that weren't paying attention and fighting didn't have the leverage. I had the leverage at that time because I was their heavyweight champion to kind of push some of those issues. Yeah. But that went by the wayside. Nobody else took up that mantle or tried to, to fight for their own ancillary rights or their own issues with those contracts. Now, obviously, you got guys like John Jones and others that are chirping about the pay. Logan Paul and Jake Paul are poking Dana on a regular, you know, guys like Ben Askren and Tyron Woodley make more money from one boxing match than they've ever made in their entire MMA career. Yeah. There's a stark problem in our sport. So, yeah. um, you know, if it takes a guy like Jake Paul to, to highlight that and, and bring that to the forefront, I'm going to get behind that. <laughs>